For millennia, men have found darkened corners, quiet rooms, locked doors, and gathered. There, it is said they conduct strange rites, act out medieval rituals, and try to remake the world in their own image. Activities shrouded in mystery, membership unknown, the marks of the secret societies. Two secret organizations may loom largest in the public mind, the Freemasons or Masons, the world's oldest and largest secret society, and Yale University's Skull and Bones, one of the world's smallest and most exclusive secret societies. Why do some say that their members will defend their brethren or protect the group's secrets at any cost? This former Mason says death threats have followed him ever since he started revealing the secret rituals of the Masons. This publisher says he was contacted by Skull and Bones member and former president George Bush when he tried to expose the secrets of that group. A one-time high-ranking detective in London charges the Masons with destroying his career when he tried to uncover an alleged Masonic conspiracy. The bonds formed among members flow from their hidden rituals. But how these ancient and mysterious ceremonies work their magic remains unexplained. In every country, Freemasonry has its unique character and its unique enemies. In the United States, the most caustic foes of the organization are conservative Christians. More than two dozen Protestant denominations have joined the Catholic Church in opposing Freemasonry. They see exotic rituals drenched in religious symbolism, bloody oaths exhumed from the Middle Ages, and an aura of mystery, and find the horns of Satan in the compass and square. In his early 20s, Jack Harris joined a Bible study class at a Baptist church outside Baltimore. Several of his classmates were Masons. My friends in the uh, Bible class told me that the Masons was mysterious, that you will learn things about God that you will never learn in a church. I liked the men that I was involved with in Freemasonry very much. They stuck together, they backed each other up. In fact, it was an all men's organization. I kind of liked that. Harris quickly advanced through the levels of Freemasonry. Within just seven years, his lodge installed him as its leader, the Worshipful Master. I had a definite, heartfelt interest in what they believed in. I had an interest in the ritual. I loved the whole association with the organization and what they taught. In 1970, after nine years in Freemasonry, Harris became a born-again Christian after watching a Billy Graham crusade on television. He began objecting to the rule that Masonic ritual cannot mention Jesus Christ because no aspect of Masonry can favor one religion. Harris found that philosophy incompatible with his version of Christianity. He quit the Brotherhood. He believes now that Freemasonry is satanic. He cites the ritual for one ceremony, which uses a human skull resting on a Bible, burning candles, and a sword aimed at the throat of a kneeling man. Identical, he says, to the altars used by worshipers of the devil. They teach you different principles of how to get to heaven, how to go live a good life, apart from Jesus Christ, contrary to the word of God, which means they're giving you a lie. Satan is the father of those lies. Harris's conclusion is the same as one of Freemasonry's most outspoken and influential opponents. A physician and author from Beaumont, Texas, Dr. Larry Holly has led the anti-Masonic fight before the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest Protestant denomination in the U.S. I believe that the system of Freemasonry, the dynamic of Freemasonry, the spirit that empowers Freemasonry is Luciferian, is satanic. Freemasonry treats Jesus Christ as a good man or a great leader or a, as a great prophet, but ignores the reality in my mind that he is in fact the only begotten son of, of God and the only way to salvation for men. Jack Harris believes the Masons have turned their satanic fury on him. After Harris left the organization in 1972, local ministers asked him to tell their congregations about the so-called evils of Masonry. 
he began to dramatize Masonic ceremonies, depicting the actual secret rituals. Behind me, to the left, is where the Worshipful Master sits. I am the Worshipful Master of the Lodge, and over his head is a symbol, the letter G. And here we have the three lesser lights of Freemasonry. Fourteen years after leaving the Masons, Harris appeared on national television, revealing the secrets of Masonry to the country. Then he says the serious threats began. Harris heard one of the most harrowing from a minister in the Philadelphia area. Reverend James Flanagan had signed an affidavit attesting that he had been told that four citizens of the state of New Jersey, later identified according to Harris as state troopers, had said they wanted to travel to the state of Maryland for the purpose of murdering Jack Harris. They promised to kill my wife, my children, and my, you know, my person, me, for revealing those secrets. Harris called the Baltimore County Police. My house was under 24-hour surveillance for one entire year as a result of these threats. Based on the threats, Harris got a permit to carry a gun. He swears that the violent penalties Masonic ritual demands of its members for exposing secrets are not symbolic, as the Masons insist, but real. If anybody would have disobeyed the obligation or would have betrayed masonry, God would have got some officers together of like mind and we would have eliminated them. We would have murdered them. I took it seriously. I was never told in masonry that the oath is symbolic. Did a conspiracy forged in the bloody oaths of Masonic initiation plot to kill Jack Harris? Every time he reveals Masonic ritual, is he risking his life? The actual 1986 complaint to the Baltimore County Police Department describes the police version of the case. The spokesman for the department explains the police response. Mr. Harris's house was not under 24-hour surveillance for a year or for any period of time at all. We got a complaint in 1986 that Mr. Harris had received third-hand a threat against his life. He supposedly exposed some rituals of a group that he belonged to. What our intelligence section did, they did some preliminary inquiries into uh, what this group was about and if there were any uh, historical actions taken against former members. They found nothing that would indicate that Mr. Harris would need 24-hour police protection from this agency. What Harris got, Novak says, is known as selective enforcement, an hourly drive-by from an officer in a squad car. He says that kind of surveillance usually lasts up to several weeks, not a year. Though Harris considered the threat deadly serious, his local police force apparently did not. After receiving the affidavit from the Philadelphia minister, Harris says he heard nothing more about the threat. Masons reject out of hand Harris's contention that Freemasonry's rituals lead to death threats. Masons say the infamous penalties for exposing Masonic secrets remain part of the American ritual because the members love tradition. Freemasons in England have removed the penalties. George Peter, a Mason for 48 years and the head historian for the Masons of the state of New York, says the penalties are strictly symbolic. No Mason, he says, ever is expected to injure or murder another Mason. People need to know that you are not binding any individual to have that happen, and it does not happen and never has happened. The penalties, according to Freemasons, exist instead to remind members that a man's life contains sacred commitments to family, country, and religion that he should be willing to die for. The penalties supposedly protect secrets, but Masons downgrade the importance of those secrets. They say the secrets exist only so one Mason can identify another. If we have a member that uh, goes and uh, gives all the secrets of Freemasonry, nothing should happen to that person. Death threats do not square with the principles of Freemasonry uh, in no way, shape, nor manner. It's just uh, foreign to the concepts of Freemasonry. According to Masons, so is Satanism. They point to the G in the American Masonic symbol. It stands for God. Gary Leeser holds a doctorate in the philosophy of religion and identifies himself as a conservative born-again Christian. The ordained minister directed the 1993 investigation of Freemasonry 
for the Southern Baptist Church. Dr. Leeser is now a Mason. I have studied Freemasonry almost full time for four years. I have read both Masonic books and books by Masonic critics, and I have examined them carefully, and I have yet to find anything in Freemasonry that I would consider to be satanic. Masonic critics believe there are only two possible understandings of God and the world. One is God's side, and the other was everybody else or Satan's side. Did the hand of Masonry try to kill Jack Harris? Without any real proof, all that remains for some is a fear of the secret society. Historians say Freemasonry, founded in 1717, has influenced virtually every fraternal order and collegiate fraternity. Wherever men meet and adopt secret rituals, they share the legacy of the Freemasons. Nearly six million members of all races and religions, all men and all believers in a supreme being, meet in nearly windowless lodges throughout the world. There, facing a central altar, their chief officer sitting in the east, they perform intricate dramas, usually based on stories from the Old Testament. The ritualistic plays are the initiation ceremonies for each new member and the core of the Masonic Rites. The Rites, according to the Masons, teach the value of honor and love, or the struggle between insight and ignorance, and the importance of trustworthiness and keeping confidences. Those values helped to convince 13 signers of the U.S. Constitution, including Ben Franklin and George Washington, to wear the Masonic apron. Fifteen presidents also were drawn to the rights of Freemasonry, including Harry Truman and Gerald Ford. Composers Irving Berlin, Mozart, and Duke Ellington were Masons, joining Will Rogers, Charles Lindbergh, and John Wayne. The rights change for each new lesson, called a degree. The essence of Freemasonry resides in its third degree. In that lesson, the initiate learns Freemasonry's essential symbolism and its most protected word as he reaches one of the pinnacles of the organization, the Master Mason Degree. This reenactment conducted by Jack Harris reveals crucial elements of the ritual for the Master Mason Degree. It begins as the worshipful master, the head of the lodge, tells the candidate he must pass one more test before becoming a master mason. You have a rough and dangerous road to travel as a test of your fidelity in keeping secret all that has been communicated to you. In your travels, you will be beset by ruffians, perhaps murdered, an instance has been known. The blindfolded candidate, accompanied by his guide, plays the role of Hiram Abiff, in Masonic lore, the master mason in charge of building the Temple of Solomon in ancient Israel. During the ritual, a temple workman attacks him. Grand Master Hiram Abiff, I am glad to meet you thus alone. You have long promised us the secrets of a master mason. Behold, the temple is almost completed, and we have yet to receive them. Give me the secrets of a master mason. This is a very unusual way and manner of asking nor is it the time and place. Wait until the temple is completed, and if found worthy, you shall receive them. This is neither satisfactory. Give me the secrets of a master mason, or I shall take your life. I cannot, neither can they be given, but in the presence of three, Solomon, king of Israel, Hiram, king of Tyre, and myself. Give me the secrets of a master mason, or I shall take your life upon this spot. My life, but not the secrets. And die. Two more attackers confront the candidate as Hiram Abiff before he is symbolically killed. Then die! Then the worshipful master raises him from the dead and finally accepts him into the arms of Freemasonry. I will now take the body by the strong grip of a master mason or the lion's paw and raise it upon the five points of fellowship. Small hall bone. Brother Smith, you have been raised to the sublime degree of master mason. And the word which I have just communicated is a grand Masonic word, which you promised in your obligation never to reveal, except in a way and manner which you shall receive it, and then only in a low breath. You have been raised upon the five points of fellowship, which are, follow me, foot to foot, knee to knee, 
breast to breast and hand to back and cheek to cheek or mouth to ear. Give me the word. Mama bird. The secret word, a part of every degree, is coupled with an oath sworn over a Bible, promising to defend fellow Masons and prescribing a blood-curdling penalty for any member who exposes the secrets or violates the oath of mutual defense. Binding myself under the no less penalty. Binding myself under the no less penalty. Than that of having my body severed in twain. Than that of having my body severed in twain. My bowels taken thence and my body burned to ashes. My bowels taken thence and my body burned to ashes. And those ashes scattered to the four winds of heaven. And those ashes scattered to the four winds of heaven. Brutal medieval penalties. Critics say they are as much a part of Freemasonry as the more than $1 million a day American Masons say they donate to charity. To their enemies, Freemasonry embraces a menacing mix of images and symbolism, forming a huge and sometimes to them a malevolent secret society. The mysterious rituals carried out behind the closed doors of the Masonic temples are said by some to nurture the seeds of conspiracy. London, the birthplace of Freemasonry, where the bonds among the brethren remain strong, perhaps some say too strong. In autumn 1981, Detective Chief Inspector Brian Willard took a new position with Scotland Yard. After nearly three decades on London's police force and seven commendations, Willard won an assignment to the elite public sector corruption unit, the Fraud Department, investigating some of England's most politically sensitive cases. Willard's commander had assigned him to investigate a group of local government bureaucrats in Islington, a borough of London. They supposedly had overpaid a construction firm by the equivalent of nearly $200,000 in a complicated kickback scheme. Soon, Willard noticed something strange in the behavior of his suspects. It seemed that there was a, a network working behind the scenes which was ensuring that information about, uh, information about facts that we needed to know was not going to come out. Willard had been told that several of the men suspected of fraud were Freemasons. I was aware uh, that Freemasonry had very binding oaths of loyalty one to another and that when people are in distress their brothers come to their assistance and this is a case which was tailor-made for that. Willard heard a borough insider was boasting that the investigation would go nowhere because the suspects belonged to the same Masonic Lodge as police officers in Willard's own fraud department. Journalist Martin Short the author of a best-selling book about the purported evils of British Freemasonry says Masonic connections between cops and criminals were well known to the London police. It became very clear in the 1970s when there were, uh, there were joint interests where Freemasons in the police and Freemasons, for instance, in the pornography trade were in the same lodges, that criminal offenders were given uh, a license to traffic without fear of prosecution. Brian Willard was aware of this history of corruption. The investigation reached a crisis after he interviewed one of the suspects, telling him not to discuss the conversation with anyone. But immediately after Willard left, he allegedly was seen rushing to the office of another key suspect at the town hall. That night, according to Willard, that suspect locked his filing cabinet, something he almost never did, and left for an unannounced month-long vacation. The next day, Willard's secretary took an extraordinary phone call from one of London's top prosecutors, the one who decided which cases would go to trial. He wanted to find out the progress of the Islington investigation. London prosecutors, according to Willard, never ask for progress reports over the phone. He now feared this prosecutor, too, was a Freemason and might have been trying to affect the case. Willard then realized he had to interview him, 
Aware that most of Scotland Yard's chiefs appeared to be Masons, he assumed they would deny his request. This forced him to make the biggest decision of his life. Instead of asking his superiors, he would ignore the chain of command and confront the prosecutor. Willard needed to find out what or who had prompted the prosecutor's call. Willard says the prosecutor told him he couldn't remember why he had called Willard. By the end of that day, Willard's commander had stripped him of all his duties. After 22 years as a highly decorated detective, he landed in uniform at a desk job in the outlying station house at Wembley. Another detective, reportedly a Mason, took over the Islington Town Council investigation. Weeks later, the case was dropped. I expected somebody to listen to why I'd done it and appreciate it. But of course, there again, the issue of Freemasonry comes in, and that existed at the highest level of the police force at that time. And of course, I wasn't aware of that. Willard reported to his new assignment and started a private lobbying campaign for an independent investigation into the reasons for his transfer. For the first time in his career, he received damning reviews written by his superiors at the station house, who he suspected were Masons. Willard refused to sign them. Nearly five years after leaving the fraud department, an anonymous ally mailed a package to Willard. It contained the secret membership list of this London Lodge that chronicled the names of nearly all of Willard's former superiors at Scotland Yard and the station house at Wembley. I'd been uh, looked at as somebody who was demented by the, the press and everybody else because I was saying this was happening to me, and nobody believed me. Well, I had proof. I had proof. I had hard evidence. In 1988, Willard, citing ill health, refused to return to work. After 33 years, he was dropped from the force and abandoned his campaign. His efforts, however, may have triggered a major policy change. In 1997, after a series of hearings, a committee in Britain's parliament made the unprecedented recommendation that Masonic police officers, judges, and prosecutors be required to make their membership public. Despite a lack of hard evidence, the committee concluded there was a public perception that Freemasons in the criminal justice system gave preferential treatment to fellow Masons. Was Brian Willard brought down by a Masonic conspiracy of police superiors, prosecutors, and corrupt officials? Are the bonds of Masonry so strong that they could compromise the sacred oath to uphold the law? Peter Burden, considered one of Great Britain's top crime reporters, was awarded the Order of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth when he retired in 1996. He says Willard was transferred simply because he ignored the chain of command and even today has never proven any of his allegations of Masonic collusion. I monitored the uh, case over many, uh, many years. Um, the problem with uh, Chief Inspector, ex-Chief Inspector uh, Willard's um, case um, was the lack of evidence. I certainly was unable to establish any evidence. I spoke to many police officers who were non-Masons who said, well, we appreciate Brian is convinced this is happening. But it's a terrible expression saying, at the end of the day, where's the evidence? I think in the Woolard case, it is quite difficult to actually prove uh, that, that, that Masons uh, did help each other. And yet, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. Not only did Willard's case lack hard evidence, but he based several of his assumptions on the belief that Freemasons' oaths of mutual support could supersede the law. England's United Grand Lodge insists the oaths are never supposed to be taken to such extremes. It's impressed on every Freemason as they're going through the three ceremonies to become a Master Mason that their obligations are to God, to the law, to their families. And any obligation that they might feel they have to another Freemason comes very much down the line after that. In the case of Brian Willard, there is no proof of any Masonic conspiracy only a perception that it could have happened. People misunderstand what goes on in the secrecy of the Lodge and say that 
it's nefarious, it's conspiratorial, but it, what it really is is a, um, a ritual moment that endures and has emotional power um, in the sacred context of the t Masonic Temple. Who comes here? A poor blind candidate who desires to be brought from darkness to light and receive a part of the rights and benefits of this right worshipful lodge erected to God. According to some historians, the power of the ritual derives from deeply male concerns, including the transition from boyhood to manhood and the relationships between fathers and sons. By what father right does he expect to gain admission? By that of being a man. The heyday of the fraternal movement happened during the mid to late 19th century, as the Industrial Revolution took hold. Men, for the first time, were leaving home to go to work and leaving women to raise the children. A previously unheard of emotional distance developed between young men and their fathers. And these rituals, in essence, confirm the fears of the young man to his distant father then work them out, ending in the young man being reconciled with his father. They embrace each other. The distant father, the young initiate, become brothers in the same family of men. According to Carnes, each mason responds to the rituals in his own way, based on his private life. It is in this private context that the secrecy of Freemasonry has its greatest effect. He agrees with most Freemasons that for more than 250 years, Critics have exposed the organization's so-called secrets. Anyone with access to a decent library can find them. The real value of secrecy, according to Carnes, is as a bond between members and a way that allows members to fully share in the ritual celebration of the nature of men and manhood. When you take the secrets of this world of mystery and you lay them out it nakedly into the world and the glare of a, of, this, of the here and now of how we live, it looks goofy and silly. But in that sacred space, it makes sense. So they need to keep the space uh, protected from eavesdroppers and those who would destroy it of its mystery. For nearly 150 years, it has stood on High Street in New Haven, dark and foreboding. On the edge of the campus of Yale University, it has no windows, and its doors remain bolted to all but the initiated. It is the impenetrable command post of one of the most prestigious secret societies in the world. Its members call the building the Tomb, Headquarters of Skull and Bones. Since 1832, 15 Yale juniors, men only until the 1990s, often the most impressive members of their class, are tapped to become bonesmen. Throughout their senior year, they gather on Thursday and Sunday nights at precisely 8 p.m., referred to within the organization as SBT, or Skull and Bones Time. Nothing that happens behind the doors of the tomb is ever supposed to be repeated, but the members say they spend those evenings eating dinner and exchanging their true feelings about themselves and the issues of the day. Discussion holds such a central position in Bones activities that Bonesmen say the number 322 on the Skull and Bones insignia refers to 322 BC, the year the Greek orator Demosthenes died. Many others claim the meetings are a boot camp for an organization that secretly controls the world's banking apparatus and its sources of political power. They also claim the skulls of Pancho Villa and Geronimo, allegedly stolen by past bonesmen, are on display in the tomb. Legend holds that all bonesmen undergo a bizarre initiation, where they lie naked in a coffin in the tomb, as they recount the intimate details of their sexual histories. The most chilling of the sagas, however, refers to the awesome power of skull and bones. These men, and now women, allegedly of privilege and descending from America's oldest and wealthiest families, are said to be invited to join a lifelong secret syndicate. A syndicate which many believe has engineered a criminal conspiracy among the world's most powerful elements. The alleged conspiracy would have included some of America's most influential leaders. 
the history of 20th century America reads like a roster of skull and bones. From William Howard Taft, the only man to serve as both president and chief justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, to financier and diplomat Averill Harriman, Time, Fortune, and Life magazine founder Henry Luce, Vietnam War architect McGeorge Bundy, and one of that war's best known opponents, William Sloan Coffin. Conservative publisher, talk show host, and novelist William F. Buckley Jr., and former president George Bush. Skull and Bones was not always so secretive. As late as the 1920s, the New York Times even reported the results of Tap Day, the day when the society chooses its new members. Not anymore. Dozens of bonesmen were contacted for this program. The rituals they performed at their tomb affected them so much that few would reveal any part of the rites. Some, however, agreed to speak off the record, and they provided a clear picture of their ultra-secret initiation ceremonies. The following is probably the most detailed recreation of a skull and bones initiation ever seen on television. Each March, the sitting class of Bonesmen extend an invitation to the candidates in the succeeding class. It happens on a night called pre-tap. Before this night, prospective Bonesmen usually have no idea that they have even been considered. Near midnight, a huge fist pounding on a dormitory room door rouses a junior from bed. He opens the door and finds someone he has never seen before. Come with me. The candidate is hustled down a hall and thrown into a room. The only light in the room comes from the candles held in front of 15 faces. Some may be familiar. A voice identifies the group as the Order of the Skull and Crossbones. You will be asked to accept or reject. One throws down a box containing names and telephone numbers of those who can answer questions about the organization. Speak of this to no one. Suddenly, the faces blow out their candles. The room turns to black as an arm pushes the candidate out the door and into the hall. He's strong-armed back to his room. About a month later, tap night falls on the Yale campus. The candidates are told to stay in their rooms. Another stranger appears at the door. Skull and bones, accept or reject. Accept. Come with me. If the candidate accepts, his initiation odyssey begins. One Bonesman from the 1980s agreed to appear on camera to reveal parts of what he experienced, but anonymously and, at times, evasively. Someone shows up at your door, you've never seen them before, and they may say, follow me, and then you may follow them, and then there may be someone else, they may lead you to someone else. Another Bonesman has described how he had to keep up with his sprinting counterpart as he ran through the campus. Eventually, the initiate arrives in the backyard of the tomb, and takes a blindfold. He or she is spun and handed off. Apparently, nothing overtly physical occurs. Then the initiate is led into the tomb. Let's say someone is in a coffin. Let's say there are candles somewhere. Let's say there is Geronimo's skull. Maybe this serves to create this environment that's otherworldly. Bonesmen escort the initiate to room 322, the inner temple of Skull and Bones, a room draped in velvet and opulence, where the Bonesmen hold their gatherings. There, members spin the candidate until he or she can barely stand. When the initiate gets his bearings, he sees for the first time that Bonesmen old and new are packing the room. The group suddenly bursts into one of the many songs written for and by Bonesmen to be sung only in the tomb. The initiation and other Bones rituals mysteriously work to convince new members that no secret told inside these walls will ever leave. Part of going through the rituals and the initiation um, is creating uh, a feeling that this is, this is a sacred place. So therefore, that, that creates this feeling of trust that having gone through this whole ritual and initiation, no one will want to break the secrecy. Bonesmen cling to that secrecy with such diligence that legends of mystery and conspiracy evolve. 
each neither confirmed nor denied by Skull and Bones. For those who believe the conspiracy theories of Skull and Bones, the initiation rites of the organization do much more than inculcate feelings of trust and a belief in secrecy. They provide the foundation for a lifetime of clandestine plots for power. In the summer of 1978, after graduating from Yale, Andrei Navrazov bought the country's oldest literary magazine, the nearly bankrupt Yale Lit, a journal with alleged shadowy ties to Skull and Bones. The 22-year-old Navrazov took the Lit National, gave it a full-color coffee table look, and Navrazov says eventually attracted 3,600 subscribers. It also changed radically from a showcase of student writing to what many Yale students and much of Yale's English department considered a right-wing journal, printing the works of obscure European writers, poets, and playwrights. After four years, Yale apparently had had enough and adopted rules that recategorized the lit as a non-student organization, requiring the magazine to remove the Yale name from its title. Navrazov, now an author living in London, took the university to court. During the litigation, he says he felt the power of skull and bones against him. After losing at the trial level, Navrazov claims he and his lawyer decided to argue on appeal that another non-student organization had operated the lid for decades without intrusion, namely Skull and Bones. Despite its location on the Yale campus, Skull and Bones is completely independent of the university. Navrazov would cite a book published in the 1870s and written anonymously that explained how Skull and Bones had subtly maintained control of the lid since 1864. They controlled it when it suited them, and when it didn't suit them, they, you know, they left it to, to, to lesser men. Navrazov says to prove his point in court, he would have to expose many of the secrets of Skull and Bones. Navrazov then received this letter from the most powerful bonesman in the world, the then Vice President of the United States. Dear friends, thanks so much for sending me the latest issue, which I will read with pride. I appreciate your thoughtfulness. With best wishes, sincerely, George Bush. Navrazov put his own conspiratorial spin on the letter. The aim of this, of the letter and the ensuing correspondence was to create the impression in us that uh, Bush personally would intercede with Yale and um, sort of call, have them call their, their, their legal hounds off. Navrazov believed Bush wanted to settle the case as soon as possible so the secrets of Skull and Bones would not come to light. He wrote to Bush, trying to imply that he wouldn't reveal the secrets if Bush would intercede on his behalf. Bush, in a series of letters, replied that he could not act as an intermediary. The last letter in the, in, in the series uh, is, is um, basically already a sign from him that they had had their way, and that at that point he didn't think we were going to get anywhere with this. Navrazov's skull and bones argument failed. In the spring of 1986, Navrazov lost his last appeal, turned the lid back to the students of Yale, and left New Haven for good. Did Bush, a former director of the CIA, make a subtle attempt in a seemingly innocuous note to propose a deal that would keep safe the secrets of Skull and Bones? Absolutely not, says Herb Parmet, one of the country's most respected historians and an authorized biographer of George Bush. There was nothing in that, that exchange of letters that was anything other than um, polite, typical George Bush, the kind of stuff that I have seen in every exchange of letters. One of the last things on his mind would be trying to subvert a guy who's taken over Yale's literary review. He followed the fortunes of it and sent a polite note. But to, to suggest anything else is mad. Some conspiracy theorists, besides believing that Skull and Bones runs the Yale literary magazine, see the members of the society as moneyed, influential soldiers in a secret war for power. 
They point to the late financier and diplomat, Averill Harriman, the product of an old and wealthy family, as a quintessential example of the omnipotent bonesman. But only a few Bones alumni actually fit that stereotype. Eddie Santiago, a labor lawyer in Chicago and Skull and Bones class of 82, did not spend his childhood chauffeured between prep schools and his parents' estate. His parents emigrated from Puerto Rico. My dad was a working stiff at, at the steel mills, South, South Works. I, I'm a lifelong Chicagoan. We've never moved from the South Side. And I used to hang in gangs so when I was 13, 12 years old. I got busted for uh, possession of a firearm. Santiago characterizes Skull and Bones as a debating society and believes it tapped him because he could articulate a unique point of view. I think they, they saw me as being one of those individuals that would fit in, uh, I guess to fit in the radical side of, of their uh, debates because I was very radical when they tapped me. And radical, I mean I was a Marxist. Santiago thinks any theory about a postgraduate cabal of sinister bonesmen is ridiculous. The fact that it has uh, prominent members in, in industry and in law and, and other areas uh, speaks very well uh, and highly of its ability to, to select uh, some of the best minds uh, in the country. Santiago revealed that when those minds gather at the tomb, they remove all watches and timepieces to signify that time stops when the club is in session. TVs and radios are forbidden. He also said that inside the tomb, members drop their real names. Other Bonesmen have disclosed that behind the closed door, drinking alcoholic beverages is outlawed. And that inside the tomb, members take on new names from characters in the 18th century novel by Lawrence Stern, Tristram Shandy. According to one Bonesman, the biggest part of what members do inside Skull and Bones is tell the histories of their lives trusting that their words will forever be kept in confidence. Their histories supposedly reach startling levels of honesty. I talked about uh, certain events in my life that I've never, never talked about before since, you know, painful things. The secrecy of the organization is part of what creates the environment that allows you to become so trustworthy and so honest with all your fellow organization members. Harvard University psychologist William Pollack says secrecy not only can encourage honesty, but also has a broader effect. The secrets are the intangible bonds between and amongst the members. The way the men hold on to each other is by holding on to the secret. Some historians and social psychologists say that whenever gender roles change, all male secret societies develop. often revamping the rituals of earlier secret societies. They point to Robert Bly's Iron John Men's Movement. When they go into the woods and pound the drums, usually they're in a meet in the sweat lodge, usually there's this sort of bonding, and that's what they call it. There's a similar sort of mysticism about it, trying to recreate the primitive rituals and primitive religious ceremonies that gave existence a deeper resonance. As boundaries between men and women fall, Experts predict a diminishing need for all-male secret societies. In 1991, Skull and Bones agreed to include women. They obviously share the men's interest in secrecy, but their membership signals a fundamental difference in the Bones experience, one that adapts to a new age. The young generation uh, of males, although still confused in a certain kind of way about what it means to become a man, are asking questions more publicly, are more willing to engage in public display of uncertainty, and are relying more on women as part of the process of defining masculinity. On the other hand, American Freemasons, who average about 65 years of age, hold to their all-male tradition. Having a secret society is not in and of itself a bad thing. It only becomes a bad thing if what's going on during the secrecy is meant to be hurtful to others. But if it's meant to protect oneself or one's masculinity or one's growth, it can be a very positive thing and a very necessary thing. Will men always need places where they can get together by themselves? Yes, probably. Will it have to be secret and ritualistic? Perhaps not, and maybe not at all. Secret societies, the supposed birthplaces of criminal conspiracy, the so-called origins of deadly plots, the purported all-powerful manipulators of events, actually exist 
to provide their members with a place of emotional comfort, where the secrecy and the ritual work in an unexplained way to allow a deep honesty with their brethren and themselves.